in the deepest section of an icy, narrow underwater cave, 443 feet below the surface. These five divers found themselves in their worst possible scenario imaginable, and only three would make it back to the surface. A GoPro camera mounted on one of the divers recorded their harrowing dive. On February 6, 2014, in Rana, Norway, a group of five Finnish men, Kai Kankanen, Patrick Grunkvist, Yari Huatarinen, Vesa Rantanen, and Yari Yu, had planned a dangerously deep cave dive. The cave in question was the Plura Grotta Cave, which is connected to the Steinula Flotget Dry Cave. Last autumn, Kai and Patrick had discovered the connection between the two entrances. They, alongside another diver, were also the first to dive from one entrance to the other, completing a so-called traverse. This experience made them confident enough to do the traverse again, but their objective this time was to start from the other entrance. The cave system reaches impressive depths, with some sections plunging down to over 426 feet, or 130 meters below the surface. It is one of the longest water-filled caves in Northern Europe, with passages extending for several kilometers underwater. The cavern presents significant challenges thanks to low visibility, narrow passages, and the maze-like tunnels. The five men were traveling in Yari Huatarinen's van, which was towing a trailer full of equipment, a snowmobile, underwater scooters, a few dozen diving cylinders, and other smaller tools. During their 15-hour drive through Finland, Sweden, and Norway, they repeatedly reviewed their plan. During the dive, the group would split into two teams, diving two hours apart. This approach helped minimize sediment disturbance and maintain water clarity. The entire dive would take five hours if everything went as planned. They arrived at Jordbru Farm in Rana, near the Plura Cave, and rested up for the night before their dive the next day. Diving to depths exceeding 130 feet or 40 meters is considered technical diving. Each was an experienced technical diver and a certified CCR full cave diver. According to international standards, they were fully qualified to carry out such a dangerous cave dive. But despite thorough preparations, experience, and training, their challenging dive would soon become a nightmare. By the time they were awake, the temperature was below freezing at negative three degrees Celsius. Nevertheless, the divers proceeded with their plan. Getting to the cave entrance meant diving underneath the frozen Plura Lake. To reach it, they had to cut through the thick ice. While Kai, Vesa, and Yari Yu left to take equipment to the Steinula Flukit cave, Patrick used a chainsaw to cut a triangular hole in the ice. Preparations were going well, despite the frigid temperatures and late start. In a short time, Patrick was through the icy layer. The water was crystal clear. Patrick asked Huatarinen if they should wait for the other group to return. Huatarinen made a silent hand gesture, signaling that it was time to dive. Patrick agreed, and they plunged into the lake just after noon. They fired up their underwater scooters to propel them to the cave. With the increasing pressures and frozen temperatures, they needed to conserve energy, which made the scooters their lifeline. Diving to such depths requires a specific mix of air and equipment to reduce the risks. The divers used a closed-circuit breathing system, CCR for short, or rebreathers. These systems were opposite a traditional open system, allowing for significantly extended dive times. Rebreathers don't discharge the exhaled gases into the water, also helping prevent sediment disturbance. Instead, the system scrubs the carbon dioxide from the exhaled air before remixing it with the diver's mixture of oxygen, nitrogen, and helium. As they continued to descend, the risk increased exponentially at those depths. They carried a third rebreather system and open circuit gas cylinders as part of their bailout reserve gas strategy to cope with a possible equipment failure. A tear in a diver's dry suit at that depth could be fatal due to the frigid temperatures and high pressures. There was also the risk of hypercapnia or excessive carbon dioxide in the bloodstream. Hypercapnia happens when the divers breathe too quickly or panic. Rebreathing technology is a double-edged sword. A malfunctioning rebreather could cause carbon dioxide poisoning, resulting in confusion, nausea, fatigue, and ultimately fainting. 
With their daylight fading quickly, Patrick and Huatarinen's descent initially took them sloping down to a depth of 34 meters for over 500 meters. Then, their path briefly rose to a 250 meter long air chamber, partially filled with water. This section of the cave was also suitable for novice divers. After the chamber, the pair continued, still using their scooters as it steeply plunged to 60 meters, then 100, and finally 130. As Patrick and Huatarinen reached the deepest part of the cave, they powered down their underwater scooters so that Huatarinen could take in the cave's beauty. Patrick had agreed with Huatarinen to practice switching to the bailout rebreather in the depths. He practiced with his reserve system for several minutes. So far, the dive was going as planned, but the adrenaline in their systems was spiking. It was time to begin their ascent. While they had already tackled the most dangerous sections of the cave, they weren't out of the woods yet. Patrick cautiously ascended first. Up ahead, a particularly narrow section made a 90-degree turn. Yet, as Patrick continued his ascent, he couldn't see Huatarinen's flashlight. It wasn't odd, considering the narrow section of the ascent. So, he waited. Suddenly, he saw his partner's light waving up and down, a terrifying sign of distress. Patrick's heart raced as he strained his eyes, searching for any sign of Huatarinen. Every second counted. Desperately, the diver made his way back, while Huatarinen yelled for Patrick to come. Huatarinen demanded that Patrick remove one of his large bailout cylinders as it seemed to block his path. Patrick detached the tank and then relocated his scooter to clear the way. He scanned the area, unsure of why Huatarinen was stuck at all. Finally, he noticed the cord of his scooter stuck between two rocks. Clearing it proved simple. Though freed from the rock, Huatarinen continued panicking, shouting to Patrick to give him the bailout gas. Things were deadly serious. The frantic diver switched from the bailout gas to his closed regulator several times. Patrick may have been trying to calm himself down, but soon Huatarinen wasn't switching between his breathing systems anymore. In fact, there was nothing in his mouth at all. Now, panicked, Patrick placed a regulator over his friend's mouth and pressed the purge button. Instead, Huatarinen inhaled the cave water, sealing his fate. Even as his mind and body tried to catch up, Patrick knew his friend was dead. The path behind them was blocked. But in his panicked state, Patrick had other problems. He needed to start ascending to the dry cave. He glanced at his dive computer as it calculated the depth and duration of the dive to tell him the number and length of decompression stops for his ascent. The computer showed that Patrick needed to stay in the two degree water for more than 400 minutes or seven hours before safely ascending to the surface. He gazed at the screen in disbelief. Just a moment before, the display had shown 120 minutes. He knew staying at that depth and pressure extended the dive. Every minute he spent at this depth was another 10 minutes of decompression. So, he had spent approximately 25 minutes in the passage. He could no longer swim back to inform the others about the situation and worried what would happen to them once they realized their path was blocked. His bailout gas was stuck with his friend's body and he had also given some of his valuable oxygen to him. Patrick had no other choice but to leave Huatarinen behind. He began his ascent calculating his slim odds of survival. At the same time, Kai, Vesa, and Yariyu were starting their dive. One by one, they descended beneath the ice and headed towards the Stein Ulaflokket cave. It was a little past 2 p.m. Despite being overprepared, Vesa wanted to bring additional cylinders as a precaution. Kai told him he wouldn't make it through with the extra cylinders, so he carried one of the extra cylinders to help Vesa. The second group moved just as quickly through the cave system. It took under an hour for them to get to the deepest section. Soon, Kai's prediction came to pass. Vesa had to remove his cylinders to get through a narrow part. Shortly after, one of his fins got caught in the guideline. A mere five-minute delay at this depth would translate to approximately an additional hour of decompression time when ascending, which frustrated Vesa. With the inconvenience averted, they continued. Realizing their ascent would soon begin, Vesa approached the 90-degree turn and froze. A sharp beeping sound cut through the depths and knew it could only mean one thing. 
It was the screech of a distress signal from a failed breathing apparatus. He tried not to look at Huatarinen floating lifelessly in the tunnel, but he was blocking the only path forward. Forcing himself to remain calm, he removed more gear to fit through the narrow passage. Yariyu's light cut through the depths behind Vesa. Through his own adrenaline-fueled emotions, he told Yari that Huatarinen was dead. When Kai came to the narrow passage, the situation escalated out of hand. Kai didn't know what was happening, only that Yari Yu exhibited signs of a distressed diver. Kai tried to calm his friend down. Yari Yu switched between his bailout gas and closed regulator system in a panicked-induced hysteria. Kai, still having a handle on his own emotions, realized that Yari Yu would kill himself if he didn't calm down. Calming his friend was useless, and in a few moments, Yari Yu died. Hardening his mind, Kai had to swim further to see ahead. He found Vesa struggling to get around Huatarinen and through the passage. Vesa was breathing heavily as he tried to squeeze through. As if one hard decision wasn't enough, Kai was forced to consider Vesa's odds of survival and his own. With time against him, he decided that Vesa was unlikely to make it. So, with two of his friends dead and another on the way, Kai forced himself to turn around. With their diving trip gone horribly wrong, Kai calculated his own odds of stepping out of the cave alive. He had two rebreathers, but only a little oxygen left, as the bailout gas was only suitable for descending, not ascending. His initial decompression stops needed to start at around 100 meters. With no oxygen reserves, he knew he wouldn't last long enough to decompress properly. He would suffocate before getting decompression sickness. Acknowledging the risks, he ignored his diving computer and skipped several stops. He made it to the air chamber, breathing in the trapped mixture and planned his next move. From the air chamber, he would head for the Pleura cave entrance. On the other end, Patrick was having his decompression stops, slowly making his way to the dry cave. Stuck with thoughts of despair and guilt, he clambered through the ascending tunnel, stopping to hug the walls as he waited out the necessary stops. Though a fair distance behind, Vesa had made it, keeping to his own schedule of decompression stops. On the other side of the cave, Kai felt responsible for the group. He had already skipped a few decompression stops. The freezing waters were unforgiving, but he kept warm by swimming consistently. Shortly after, his underwater scooter gave out, significantly slowing his progress. He estimated that he could make it to the entrance from the air chamber in 15 minutes, but with his scooter out of commission, it took 45. He wasn't the only one ascending too quickly. Both of his surviving companions were also doing it, and they knew it was only a matter of time before the aching, prickling, and numbness of decompression sickness set in. They had covered 400 meters while submerged at over 100 meters, Kai twice as much. Exhausted with depleting oxygen and rebreather filters, none of them could manage the required decompression stops any longer. Then, Patrick saw something he thought he'd never see. Vesa's headlamp filtered through the water below him. Feeling some of his strength returning, Patrick made the remaining required stops. He surfaced sometime after 9 p.m., about 90 minutes before it was safe. Sitting in the dry cave, he waited for Vesa. At three meters, Vesa's arms began to ache. Once in the dry cave with Patrick, his right knee started twinging in pain. Around 1.30 a.m., Kai emerged from the cave entrance to the pond in pitch-black darkness, expecting to see the hole they had cut, but it was gone. He aimed his light at the layer of ice above him and began searching for the hole. Although he knew its location, he couldn't find it. Kai eventually located the hole concealed beneath a layer of ice approximately one centimeter thick. After breaking through, he carefully placed his gear on the frozen surface and climbed out of the water. There was no sign of anyone else. At that moment, Kai thought he was the only one who made it. Still reeling from his nearly 12-hour dive, he went to the van. Stashing his spent gear, he started the engine and rested. Patrick and Vesa had returned to the farm to change into dry clothes and call the authorities for their friends. There was still no sign of Kai. They feared he had met the same horrible fate. Then, after 2 a.m., they noticed the light on in the van. Making their way to it, they were happy to see that Kai had made it. 
The news of the passing of two Finnish nationals quickly circulated that Friday, garnering significant attention. While the three divers were undergoing treatment in a hospital, the police interrogated them. The local authorities were faced with the challenge of retrieving the bodies of the victims from the cave. They called on three experienced British divers to conduct the operation. However, they had issues retrieving Huatarinen and Yari Yu. Believing it was too dangerous, officials chose to leave them in the cave. They imposed a diving ban and closed off the area. Still, the three divers vowed to retrieve their friends. In the spring, the divers finally fulfilled that promise. Due to anxiety, Kai couldn't participate. Vesa couldn't dive due to a spinal injury caused by his decompression sickness. So, he decided to be the surface manager for the rescue operation. This left Patrick to take on their noble cause. With many of his friends and even more preparation, they went to get Yari Huatarinen and Yari Yu. Ultimately, it was Patrick and Sami Pakarinen who brought their friends back. They could finally give them the honor their memories deserved.